Well, hello, everyone. It's so good to see all of you, or at least uh, be with you, not see all of you, but be with you today. Uh, we're going to get into the Word in a minute, but uh, I have a couple of things I want to say. Well, you know, you saw in the video that uh, part of what we do and, and the reason why God has called us to be uh, where we are today is because of the campuses. Our, our calling and our stewardship is to reach the future leaders. And to this day, that still is the heartbeat. And we do have a thriving church in Katipunan, as you saw earlier. Uh, one of our graduates recently graduated as summa cum laude. And so, uh, but at the same time, I do want to say that um, our senior pastor who's there right now is actually moving into a new season. Um, he is, he's been a businessman for a long time. And then for the past uh, couple of decades, he also is uh, been pastoring. He planted our church in, uh, in Lipa. Uh, was in our church in Los Baños, uh, recently moved to Katepunan. And so for, uh, but at this time, um, his father is needing some help uh, with the business. His father is now 80 years old. So he will still be a pastor, volunteering as a pastor, but he will now uh, uh, be shifting roles. And so as a result, one of our pastors here at the fort is moving to Victory Katepunan, who actually was originally from Victory Katepunan. And uh, that's Pastor Chris Flores. And so I don't know if Pastor, is Pastor Chris here? Okay, we want to uh, have Pastor Chris come in. And we want to pray for Pastor Chris because, you know, uh, hi, Pastor Chris and Joanne. There. There. Good to, Good see, to you. see you. Can you hear can us? You hear us? Yes. yes. Okay, okay, I can hear you. Okay. okay. And, so and so I just so wanted, I wanted to say, to say uh, we, before, before we pray, pray for him, him I, I, I want to say that I appreciate Pastor, Pastor Chris and Joanne. And they actually, actually graduated, graduated, both of them, from UP Dilaman also. And they have been... Tremendous, tremendous blessing. Some of you, um, maybe, um, maybe if you can put that in the comment section. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, Pastor, Pastor Chris. You've been a blessing. And I know many of you have been blessed by their lives and their ministry while they've been here at the fort for about almost seven years, six plus years. But they're uh, moving back to Katapunan. Uh, they, they, uh, uh, if you slash, uh, if you open up their hearts today, um, you're going to see maroon blood there. Okay. And so they really uh, are, are excited. Um, the Lord uh, will give them that task now of leading our church in Katipunan. And a lot of our leaders, not just uh, ministry leaders, but even the leaders of this nation from economics to uh, national government to um, education come from UP, from Ateneo, from Miriam and all the schools around, even Philippine science. And so we want to take a moment and pray for them as we send them off to lead our church in Victory Katipunan. Uh, Pastor Chris, Johnny, anything you want to say? Um, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Um, uh, well, on behalf of my kids and from the bottom of my heart, I just want to say thank you. Victory for it. Thank you for the six wonderful years. Thank you for the six wonderful years that we spent here. I think this is one of the best decisions we've made as a couple, as a family. To, to move, move here, here and be and, and, and serve and with, with Pastor Paolo and Athagen and Pastor Joey at the time and Miss Marie. So we so just want to thank, thank you. We are we so are grateful. grateful. And, and know, know that, 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 that we will bring you with us. You'll always be in our hearts. Spiritual family will always be spiritual family. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, everyone. Pastor Paolo, thank you so much. Uh, to all our, all other, our pastors, other pastors, our staff, our staff, our staff, and um, um, uh, our church mates uh, in Victory Fort, uh, we're so blessed to uh, be part of the church family for the past six years, and um, you have allowed us to um, have a broader definition of church, of uh, spiritual family, uh, of faith. Of, of leadership, leadership and even pastoring. pastoring. So, so, so uh, from our, our family, family, we are, we are so grateful. grateful. We're praying, praying the best, best for all of you and for the church, church our church, church in Victory church, Fort. 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 And, and again, again, uh, again yeah. this is this our, is our uh, spiritual uh, family, family as well. As well. Yeah. And we will always, always you know, cherish, cherish the stories, our friend, your friendships. We're so thankful that God has blessed us with so many friends. Also, also in Victory in Point in the past six years. And so, maraming, maraming, maraming salamat po. And kung magawi po kayo ng katipunan, please do visit us when we have uh, services time. 
Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Chris and Joanne. Maraming salamat. Joanne, thank you for saying something. Um, she's, she's been in all these send-offs with leadership groups and victory group leaders, and she hasn't been saying anything, but uh, it does mean a lot for us to hear from you. Thank you. I know uh, you didn't want to say anything because... Uh, for whatever, whatever reason, reason. <laughs> and so thank, so thank you thank, thank you, you. Uh, Chris, uh, Chris thank you also for your friendship, your friendship. Uh, he's, yeah, yeah, he's, yeah, yeah. you know guys you know, pastor, pastor Chris has not just been, been uh, somebody, somebody who I've co-labored, co-labored with but he's actually become, become a, a really really good friend and it's it's, it's wonderful. wonderful it's one thing to co-labor with another minister but it's another thing to co-labor with a friend so thank you pastor Christian we want to pray for them and honor them and bless them and just in case again you so they're in Katipunan, Fort Bonifacio, Andres Bonifacio is a Katipunero, so we're all connected. And so we want to uh, pray for them. Lord, thank you for Pastor Chris and Joanne. Thank you for their ministry. Thank you for their heart for the next generation. Lord, as they have been um, homegrown and birthed, Lord, in the campus. They met you and they have found their calling in you, in the campus even, Lord. I pray that you, as we send them off, we pray for them. We pray that your blessing, your anointing uh, would be upon them, their family as well, God, their children. Uh, Lord, this is a call for the family, not just for Chris, Lord. And pray that you will equip them. You have already equipped them and you have prepared them for this, for such a time as this. Lord, thank you. And we're going to see, Lord, thousands upon thousands of students, Lord, next generation leaders of this nation, Lord, of this nation, Lord, from uh, Lord, uh, uh, economics to national leadership to education to banking, to all sorts of uh, spheres in society, Lord. We bless them, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Chris and Joanne. God bless you. We love you guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, we are uh, grateful for technology, and, and uh, some of our guys are here, actually. I um, wanted to say hello to some of the people who are attending with us. Um, Jim, I just want to say hi, Jim. Jim, can you hear me? Okay, Jim here just got baptized. We had our Victory Weekend uh, recently. Okay. We just had our victory weekend recently, and um, we did it virtual. And we did, uh, they, they also had their baptism, and so he got baptized. Uh, in the virtual background, yung likod mo, no? that's uh, okay. So that's really, really uh, uh, a pool by, behind you. And so, uh, just congratulations. And not just Jim, but there's a lot of uh, them who, uh, you know, went through victory weekend. And so, um, anyway, thanks for joining us today. We'll get into the word today. And we will be in, in Romans chapter 8, which is actually the crescendo of this chapter. Um, we're moving towards that part where um, Paul asks the question, what can separate us from the love of God? In fact, you and I today, okay, we think about when COVID crisis hit. I was listening to a podcast one time. And when COVID crisis hit, uh, there was a question that was posed in that podcast that I listened to. And, and it said something like this. You and I may not be exposed to COVID, but what has COVID exposed in us? You and I may not have been exposed to COVID, but what has COVID exposed in us? And, you know, we found out where our insecurities lie or securities, right? What are the real essentials? Health, family, relationships. You know, our hearts have been exposed, um, whether that would be anger or love or compassion, Right, Our gaps and our weaknesses, even our sinful hearts have been exposed. Somebody said it this way, crisis does not create character, but it reveals it. And it's in crisis that we also begin to ask, does God still love me? I don't know if some of you are watching today, you're asking that question. I lost my job. Does God still love me? My mom has COVID. Does God still love me? My business has fallen apart. Does God still love me? What determines the love of God in your life today? That's a good question to ask. Is it possible to exhaust the love of God? Is it possible to do that? You know, will we hear, will we ever hear God say, Oh, you really did it this time. You've crossed the line. I don't know if I have enough love in my tank for you. But Paul in Romans chapter eight, as we will read in verse 31. Okay. Um, The last part answers this question. This is now um, a a question that he answers. And you see, here's, I want to preface it by saying this. I can know that God loves me now by what Christ did for me then. 
I know that God loves me now by what Christ did for me then. And this is so important, guys, because um, it's not our current circumstance that will determine if God loves us or not. It is what he has done for us. God demonstrated his love for us, Romans 5 eight, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so verse 31, let's read in chapter 8. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Now question, what are the these things? What are the these, right? And so um, many scholars would say it's not just chapter 8, the these things, but in chapter 1 to 7, up to 8, these are the these things, right? What are these things? Romans 1 to 3, he says we're under judgment. 1 to 3, right? 321, he pivots and says there's a righteousness that comes from God. It's been revealed through Jesus. Chapter 4 says we are saved by faith alone. Chapter 5, we've been reconciled back to the Father. Chapter 6, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus. Chapter 7, we've been released from this law. Listen, we've been released and we don't have to perform. We don't have to try to, you know, there is a standard. Somebody performed and met that standard on our behalf. We don't have to try to keep working for that standard. Jesus paid the price for that. Chapter 8, we've been adopted as sons and daughters of the king. And so now these are the these things. And he says, if God is for us, who can be against us? That's what he's saying here. Now the word if in the original Greek or in its original language um, signified a fulfilled condition, not just a mere possibility. It's not just a mere possibility, but it's a fulfilled com- uh, condition. It's not if God's really a good God, if re- you know, maybe... It's not that it's, in fact, you can translate it this way. Since God is for us, then who can be against us? In other words, in view of this fact that God is for us, nothing, no one can be against us. Somebody say amen to that, right? Who can be against us can be a dangerous statement because, you know, some people have abused it. Okay, Even people of of other world religions have extreme uh, uh, extremely taken it and abused it, right? But we need not discard this statement even if people abuse it because it is gloriously true. If you're in Christ, God is for you. If God is for us, Paul is not asking who's against us because you know what? There's a lot of people, a lot of things that are against us. Our past is against us. The devil is against us. The world is against us. We can't just grit our teeth and say, no, this time I'm going to make it work. This time, I really mean it this time, right? Paul doesn't ask who's against us. He's, asked, he's saying God is for us. God is never neutral. God is not neutral about us. We're undeserving, yes, and yet he unconditionally loves us. His love for us is inexhaustible. You know, think about it for a moment. It's like one of my favorite, um, my son is here. Okay. Hi, Nate. Okay. <laughs> so one of my favorites is um, um, to eat is pho. Okay. I, I don't know if I'm F, a P-H-O. Okay. Pho. All right. Vietnamese. The, the Vietnamese noodles. Right. And so I, I, I love that. And so in Hanoi today, okay, I can surmise somebody's buying pho. Somewhere, right? Or even at least the ingredients of fa. Right? And so now here's the thing. Since God created all things, right? Therefore, all things cre- relate to God and are directed by God. All things interconnect. Listen, we live in a coherent universe ordered by a sovereign and a provident God, right? And so all these things, right? Me- meaning, so the purchase of that fa by someone in Hanoi somehow connects back to the purposes of God, so that it could fulfill the purposes of God in my life. Now think about that for a moment. Somehow, everything God connects for the, all these things work together, Romans 8, 28, for our good, ultimately for his glory. It's going to blow your mind. How can this God do this? He's all powerful, almighty. Everywhere else in the world and everywhere else in the universe, Uh, works together for our good, for his glory. See, God, the maker of heaven and earth, is for you. 
It's for you. Because he lives and overcame the greatest enemy in Calvary. We know that. You know, Martin Luther, um, there was one time he, you know, there was a moment in his life. He was so distraught. He was so, he was frustrated, disappointed, in distress. All that rolled into one. And so every time he would go home, he would just like, you know, shoulders hanging low and his head looking down. And his wife, Katie, you know, was just tired of this posture. His wife was a, a powerful woman of faith, right? And so one time, Katie got a, a black cloth, put it on, the, on their front door, which was a symbol of death, and, and put on a black dress. And so, of course, Martin Luther comes back home and asks the question, you know, why are you in a black dress? You know, what, who died? And, and what further burdens do you want to add in my life today, right? And, and who died? You know what Katie said? God did. And of course, Martin Luther is like, what heretical statement are you saying? And then from this, Katie said, well, the way you've been living your life the past few days, it's a sif. God was dead. Oh, what a sarcastic rebuke from KD. And so it's like from that, he goes to his office and then he writes the Latin word V V I V E T, vivet, okay? Meaning he lives. He lives. My God lives. Question number two. And there are four questions we're, we're going to approach today or look at today. So the first one, if God is for us, who can be against us? Number two um, is verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Right? Where did God not spare his son? Calvary. The cross. Okay. What happened? The father gave him up. The father sacrificed his son. He did not spare his son, but gave him up. And then he says here, how will he not give us then all other things? Now, this doesn't mean necessarily mean he will give us everything that you want. That's not what this is saying. But all things necessary for our salvation, sanctification, and glorification. All things pertaining to our redemption. All things so that we can be conformed in the likeness of Jesus Christ. Justification, our sanctification, and our glorification. How will he not graciously give us all things? This is a, Jew, a classic Jewish argument. From the greater to the lesser. Let me give you an example. Let's say... You know, I bring my family, okay, to Hong Kong Disney, okay? Pauline, you like Hong Kong Disney? Okay, it'll work, okay? So, say we go to Hong Kong Disneyland, right? And so, we, we, uh, we, we purchase the tickets. We get the tickets for Hong Kong Disney. We get book a hotel, Tung Chung, near, the, near Hong Kong Disney, right? And so, you go on an MR, MRT, and I say, Jen, wait. It's, it's 10 US dollars to take the MRT, I don't know if I can pay for that. How many of you know, Jen will say, Paolo, that's ridiculous. You, you paid for the airfare. You paid for the hotel. You paid for the Disney tickets and you don't want to pay for the MRD tickets. This is what Paul is saying. This is the argument Paul is saying. God already gave his most precious son. How will he else not give you all other things? Is this making sense? Is this making sense, guys? Jordan, okay, so this is important, right? And so God gave his son, what else will he not give you? That's the magnitude of his love for us. At one point, will God say, you've gone too far? I love you, but you know, this is too much. Deals off. That's unthinkable. Why? Because, because we deserve his patience? Because we, need to be deser we deserve to be treated well? No, Jesus was abandoned in our place so that God would never abandon us. God is so committed to you the way he's committed to his son. As the father had loved me, so I have loved you, Jesus said. God loves you the same way he loves his son. It's like, what? Nothing to do with our performance. Nothing to do with that. Everything to do with Jesus and the cross. God is rich with love and it's a big, he's a big spender. He's that extravagant. 
God loves with God-sized love. That's the way he loves. With a God-sized love. Let me give you an example or an illustration. Frigid, non, fridge of Nonsen. Okay, it was a Norwegian explorer back in the 1800s. Right? He tried to measure the, the depth of the Arctic Ocean. He went to a spot in the Arctic Ocean and he wanted to uh, uh, measure it. And so he had a measuring line. First day, he tried to measure it and it was so deep, the line didn't make it to the bottom. And so he logged it in his logbook deeper than that. The next day, he goes back, adds to that line, right? Doesn't make it to the bottom. Day two logbook, deeper than that. Day three, added to the line, didn't make it to the bottom again, deeper than that. Seven days to eight days, he didn't even make it. He wasn't able to measure how deep the Arctic Ocean was, deeper than that. I don't know how you measure God's love today. But no matter what kind of measuring stick you're using, God's love, deeper than that. My stuff, my provision, what, what, deeper than that. My healing, myself, deeper than that. However you want to measure the love of God in your life, deeper than that. Question number three. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn God? Uh, Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, was raised, who was at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. So this is the third question. Okay? First one, if God is for us, who can be against us? Number two, will he not give us, graciously give us all things? Number three, who will condemn? Who will charge? Who will have a charge against us? Right? Our sin, though extremely serious, cannot defeat the love of God. Again, that's another dangerous statement. But that, and it is up subject to abuse, but that does not negate the fact that it is true. Going back to Martin Luther, the reason why he was distraught, sometimes he got, he was reminded of his sinful past. And the devil would come and, 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 and attack him and accuse him and condemn him. He wrote in his journal this, he said, Satan, you will not prevail against me when you try to terrify me by setting forth the greatness of my sins and try to bring me into heaviness, distrust, despair, hatred, contempt, and blasphemy against God. And then he says, on the contrary, when you say I'm a sinner, you give me armor and weapons against yourself so that with your own sword, look at this, so that with your own sword, I may cut your throat. And tread you under my feet. For Christ died for sinners. As often as you object that I'm a sinner. So often you remind me of the benefit of Christ. My Redeemer. On whose shoulders, not on mine, lie all my sins. So when you say I'm a sinner, you do not terrify me. But comfort me immeasurably. You know, those of you who used to fly, we don't get to fly as much these days. Um, and, and not a, a lot of flying these days. But when, you remember when you would buy a ticket and then you'd wait in the gate and you're just waiting for the airplane to leave, waiting for that call to board. You're just chill. But to those who are in standby, <laughs> they're not chill. I have been on standby a few times, right? And I was nervous. It's nerve-wracking. I, will I ever get into this flight? Will I, be, will I be bumped off, right? But to those who have a ticket, they're relaxed because they're confirmed. Their ticket is confirmed. See, you and I, we have a confirmed ticket. The ticket, ticket has been... Ins uh, uh, sorry, let me say that again. The ticket has been issued by the Father, paid for by the Son, and confirmed by the Spirit of God. So he says, who will bring charge against me? Who will now condemn me? I already have a ticket. God paid for it. Jesus paid for it. Purchased it for me. Many will bring a charge. Surely many will. In the cancel culture we live in today, surely people will bring a charge. You and I will make mistakes. We will. You will. I will. We will. On this side of heaven, we will. 
In this side of eternity, positionally, we're holy. Experientially, we're being made holy. We're works in progress. As a follower of Christ, listen, you will falter. But if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive, the Bible says. And even as a church, listen, we're far from perfect. I don't know if it's a disappointment. (laughs) Far from perfect. We make mistakes. But keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Even, in fact, offense, that's going to happen. You'll get offended by your victory group leader or by a victory group member or by a volunteer or by somebody, by even the person speaking in front of you today on the screen. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Satan will try to condemn. Satan will try to bring a charge. But that's why Romans chapter 8 verse 1, the first part of this chapter says, There is no more condemnation in Christ. N.T. Wright said it this way. This is the foundation of our Christian joy. That's why we sing. When, when Jordan was leading earlier uh, uh, with, with the team, with Daniel, with Pauline, and with Nate, right? When they were singing earlier, we're not, it's not a front act. It is part of our, our, our worship. To, this is, other faiths don't have a lot of singing. Christianity has a lot of singing. Why? Because this is the foundation of our joy. We sing in exuberance because no more condemnation in Christ. Listen, when you, when it's part of, when, when we're worshiping, I love what Kian was saying earlier. He said, you know, when you come, turn off notifications. I know, I know it's, it, we're so mobile today. You know, we can be watching and then you're cooking, you're cooking your lunch and uh, you're checking your email or you're replying to somebody's message. Please don't do that. This is not, this is, this is a moment where we can worship. This is a moment. We have the rest of the week to do the emails, to do the messaging. And we have the rest of the, and it's okay. If we eat at 1 p.m., okay lang naman yun eh. Medyo malit ng konti because we didn't cook at 10 a.m. That's fine. But, but, the foundation of our joy, of the Christian joy, is because we've been set free and there's no more condemnation. That's why in the song, It Is Well With My Soul, I know we sing this every so often, right? My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my soul. Listen. The enemy knows your name, but calls you by your sin. But God knows your sin, but he calls you by your name. Oh, the bliss. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. You know, remember the, sorry, we're running out of time, but this is just, this is the crescendo of Romans chapter eight. Um, Remember the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years? It's in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so Jesus was walking among the crowd, and this woman touches his robe, and Jesus feels power come out of him. Right? Remember that story? And then uh, uh, the woman gets healed instantaneously. Right? Instantaneously, she gets healed. Jesus could have gone straight and did not, he didn't have to stop. Because he healed the man. And then he could just go and talk to other people there. But he stopped. Look at this. Picture this in your mind. He stopped, looked at the woman. Right? She says, you're healed. In front of everybody else, he declares, you're healed. You know, you and I are healed by his stripes on the cross. We're healed. Ultimately, our sins have been wiped away. We've been healed because of Christ's death on the cross. So he declares healed. But you know what? He didn't just declare that he was healed. She was healed. He declared, he said, daughter, your faith has healed you. All her life, because she was considered unclean, Leviticus, in the Levitical law, okay, said, you call out and tell everybody else you're unclean. Nobody can touch you, right? You're considered unclean. And so all her life, everybody was 12 years. 
Nobody wanted to touch her. And now in front of everybody else, Jesus says, you're clean. Not only that, he says, daughter, you're healed. He calls her daughter. While everybody else have cut off their relationship with her, Jesus begins a relationship with her. Removes every shame attached to her uncleanness. That's what Jesus did for you and for me. Not only did he take away our guilt and heal us from our guilt, he also took away our shame. We can stand before our Heavenly Father and say, Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. And by this sacrifice, I have access to your throne. Let me wrap it up. Last question. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, or danger, or sword. When we go through these things, we begin to doubt God's love sometimes, right? When there's problems, there's tribulation. Or do you really love me? I lost my job. Do you really love me? Distress, this is really painful. My my husband left me for another woman. Do you really love me, Jesus? I, I was engaged. I was supposed to be engaged. But Lord, why did my fiancé leave me? Do you really love me? Uh, Lord, I, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. Lord, this is happening in my life. Do you really? Are you sure? I, I thought you said you loved me. Sometimes we let our current circumstances dictate the love of God for our lives. But as we go through these, do we get separated from Christ? Paul says, no, no. You know, the Roman gods were capricious. One wrong move, you're canceled. One wrong action, you're separated from their love. Paul says, Our, the God of the universe, the God of all gods is not like the Roman gods. You're not canceled. Where do we get this love? From him and him alone. And that's why he says in verse 37, I'll end with this one. No, in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. More than con- In all these things, God doesn't always pull us out of these things. And so he's saying through all these things, in spite of all these things, as we go through these things, we're more than conquerors. Is this mere, and then look, look at the, sorry, look at verse 37. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Is it mere empty triumphalism? Our winners, it's just, Toxic positivity in a sense like, ah, ne, panalo tayo, di ba? No, what does to be more than conquer? What does this mean? I need you to listen to this, okay? To be a conqueror means to be victorious. To be more than a conqueror means to be more victor- victorious, right? What does that actually mean? When you're a conqueror, it means the enemies, your enemies are dead at your feet. Okay? You're a conqueror. You defeat the enemy. They're dead at your feet. But when you say you're more than a conqueror, your enemies, yes, are dead at your feet, but they rise again, no longer as your opponents, but they rise again to serve you. What does that mean? It's like nakedness, famine, tribulation, all these things. Remember, he uses the these, these phrase, all these things. Persecution, famine, distress, all these things now rise from their feet and serve you. You are more than a conqueror through him who saved you in all these things. And that's why you look at all these things, famine, persecution, all the stuff, problems, bring it on. It does not faze me. Christ's victory on the cross makes us victorious in this life and in the life to come. Robert Bruce, who was a pastor in 1631, Church of Scotland, was having breakfast with his family. And then he asks his daughter, daughter, could you open to Romans chapter 8? This chapter, it, she starts reading. And then after she finishes reading, she, he puts his hand on the Bible and says, In these words, I will die believing. In these words, I will die believing. What a great way to live and a great way to die. You know why? Because that night, he said, in these words, I die believing. I will die believing. 
I have breakfast with you this morning. I'm having breakfast with you now. Tonight, I'll have dinner with Jesus. I don't know how he found out, but that evening, he was with Jesus. In these words, I will die believing. I may fall, but underneath me are the everlasting arms of God. And that's why he says, last verse, for I'm sure, either death nor life, angels, rulers, things present, things to come, powers, height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of Christ or the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. No spiritual powers, no, no, no thing, no circumstances. Application, quick one. Number one, worship him. First one, worship him. Gospel preaching should always bring us to our knees to worship the king. Worship him. Again, it's the foundation of Christian joy when we, when we worship him. That's why, again, next week when you go praise and worship, don't just checking, be checking your email. Worship him. Number two, weep. Right? Because there are those who need to hear this. And people who are, we need to lament and weep. Because sometimes this is a, uh, a lot of people need to hear this. And that's why people strive to work for this love. We can't work for this love. It's already been, been, been given to us. When we work for it and we try to achieve it, and then we're, there's a certain level of success, we feel arrogant. But when we miss it, we throw it all together and say, I can't meet, reach the love of God. And that's why we go weep, weep for ourselves, weep for this nation, weep for the love of God so that the love of God will be poured out in this nation. And then finally, witness. Worship Him. Weep for this nation. Weep for yourselves. Lament. And then witness. And then understand only the love of God can. And so when you're overflowing with this love, you can tell people, Jesus is good, eternally good, and His love never fails. Amen? Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, thank You for today. Lord, what a... I wish we had more time, Lord, to talk about this. It's just a... so rich. This is the crescendo of chapter 8 of Romans. And so, Lord, I pray that as we bow our, our hearts before you in quietness, just be quiet for a moment. Don't click off first. Don't move to another event or activity in the house. Don't start cooking. Don't do anything yet. Take this moment to be quiet before the Lord. Some of you need to receive that love. You've been searching for love wherever, everywhere else. From this guy, that girl. From this boss to this career. From your mom and your dad. And, and that's great. But even that love is limited. Lord, Heavenly Father, Creator, Maker of heaven and earth, pour out your love right now. It's the only kind of love that will make us feel secure. breath and, and say, Lord, I receive that love. Lord, it's not my current circumstances that dictate your love. Thank you, God. We receive it. Take a deep breath. We receive it. as we also wrap our time together. We don't want to just receive and keep it to ourselves. We look at our nation and it's in a it's in a situation that is way beyond us. There's suffering. There's illness. There's injustice. There's unrighteousness. 
there's corruption, there's health problems, there's economic problems. Lord, our hearts weep, but thank you that our hope is in you. We can tell people that hope is found in you. name. Amen. Amen. I, I just pray that as we go through this week, we would just remember that. When you doubt, look at me, when you doubt, does God really love me? You look at the cross. And then you will be able to tell yourself, yes, God loves me. Amen. Have a great, great week ahead. God bless you.